Okay, everyone. I want to welcome everyone. I'm Dawn Frisbee Byers. I'm the Senior Director of Content and Engagement for the Pennsylvania Humanities Council. And on behalf of all of my colleagues and our friends and partners at the Office of Commonwealth Library, I want to thank you for attending our third and final session of the Reimagining Community Engagement Series. The PHC's mission is to put the humanities in action, and we really believe in the power of sharing stories through dialogue so we can increase understanding of people and places. So what a journey we've been on. I've enjoyed all three of these amazing, two of these amazing sessions and looking forward to today's session. Uh, the first one we talked about really what it means to belong to a community. And we had the honor of being led by Philadelphia's poet laureate, Trapita Mason. At the second session, we talked about what community, how community engagement is being used in different places across the state. Uh, and we were led by Michael O'Brien from the Village of Humanities, Arts and Humanities. Today, we have a stellar lineup. So excited to uh, listen to these wonderful, wonderful practitioners. And we're led by the Humanities Council's own Ulysses Slaughter, who is our project director. So I just want to remember to remind you to remember to uh, complete the survey at the end. We are getting this series evaluated and your input is invaluable. Thank you again for attending and I'm going to turn it over to Julia. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us again. Um, it has been such an honor to convene this network of statewide and cross-sector leaders and change makers. Um, and as Don mentioned, the series has really moved from personal to institutional, um, to systemic shifts we can make that the center equity in and through the humanities in our community engagement work. Um, so today, a little bit about what to expect. Um, if you could go to the next slide, Taylor. Today you'll hear from national leaders who will help connect the dots between personal and organizational reflections that we have been doing and doing around systemic and, sorry, connecting the dots to systemic implications as we look to the future of this work um, in a changing reality. Again, you'll be on mute during the panel to manage background noise. So please continue to share what's resonating for you in the chat. Um, we'll also have time after the panel to meet in breakout groups um, for a little bit longer than last time um, so that you can come up with some action plans and reflect on what you're taking away from today and from the series. Uh, the session is being recorded besides the breakout groups and will be shared with you after and with a, a wider audience. Next, next slide. <clears throat> As some of you may know, Mark Lamont Hill, uh, has, who was originally going to be our moderator, has been recovering from COVID-19 and is unfortunately no longer able to moderate today's panel. Um, I know we all wish him a smooth recovery. And it is my honor to introduce our new moderator, Ulysses Slaughter. Ulysses is a creative reconciliation strategist, author, and filmmaker behind the powerful documentary series, Odyssey to Save Ulysses, a recipient of the 2013 Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Award in Philadelphia. His expertise in difficult, high stakes reconciliation matters is the subject of the transformative documentary series, Reconciled, which he co-created for the Oprah Winfrey Network in November, 2012. Among his most profound projects to date is the Philadelphia Remember Move Reconciliation Initiative. Ulysses is a program consultant with the Chester Housing Authority, and I have the honor of working with him at PHC through his leadership of our Chester MADE program. 
So thank you again, Ulysses, for stepping up to this um, important role today. And I'm gonna pass to you to introduce our panelists and welcome them. Julia, thank you and everyone else, thank you for being here. I can't think of a more um, humble opportunity than to be called in at the last moment and asked to do something like this. Uh, it is, it's humbling, it's exciting, and, and I'd like to get down to the business of why everybody is with us today. Uh, I'm gonna spend as little bit of time giving context. I'm gonna set it up though by uh, delivering one of those quotes that everybody here I'm sure has heard. That quote says, may you live in interesting times. And boy, don't we live in interesting times. I don't know that we could have asked for more interesting times to live in. And with that, I think that it's so important in these interesting times to have some inspiration in interesting times, to, to feel like uh, I, I throw out a lot of quotes. I, I am a self-admitted plagiarist. Uh, one of my favorite quotes comes from uh, Stevie Wonder. One of my favorite songs is Stevie Wonder's As. He has this line where he says, we all know sometimes life's hates and troubles can make you wish you were born in another time and space, but you can bet your life in that and twice as double that God knew exactly where he wanted you to be placed. One of my favorite lines, and I always think about that line when things around me get tough. Uh, today I've asked the panelists already, and I'm asking those of you who are joining us, to give us a song. We're going to create a community engagement playlist. So something that you can look back on. I want everybody to consider giving us a, a song. Now, the Stevie Wonder song was not mine. That's not the one I'm going with. I'm actually going to go with something from the Jacksons. And I'm going to type it in here into the chat room. The Jacksons during the 80s, some of you will know, and some of you were not even born. Uh, but the Jacksons had this great song called Can You Feel It? That's going to be my contribution to the playlist. Can you feel it? Because we are living in interesting times. We are exactly where we need to be. And this panel today is going to deliver some incredible insights and inspiration. So that's my song. Give some thought to your song. Plug it in as you, as you will. All right, so let's get down to the business of uh, introducing our panelists. You all have had an opportunity to see the people who are joining us. Um, I'm gonna start with uh, Mr. Fink because before we got started, Mr. Fink said that he was going, he would be happy to give us a song and we gonna, we gonna, are, are you ready, Mr. Fink? You got a little song oh, well, for us? What, uh, what, what, what vein are you thinking? What, what kind of mood? What you feeling like, man? What, what you, what, what's it feel like? What do you wanna oh, sing man. for us? Give us something to get this thing started. Well, uh, this is one. <laughs> Oh man, I, if it, Sarah, if I could pull that off, um, be a better man. Oh, you, you're all doing your songs. You're not telling me to sing Marvin Gaye. Okay, <laughs> cool. Um, Cause I was getting a little worried there. Here's one, um, my friends and colleagues in East Kentucky will off, um, start off with, you may know it. Um, if you know it, go ahead and sing along. Bright morning stars are rising. Bright morning stars are rising. Bright morning stars are rising. Days are breaking in my soul oh how can i be lonely my friends are all around me their loving arms surround me Days are breaking in my soul. Right on, Ben. Thank you so much, man. 
Ben is the founding organizer of the Performing Our Future Coalition at Roadside Theater, a grassroots theater company in the East Kentucky coal fields and part of a multimedia organization, Apple Shop. He works alongside communities in the East Kentucky coal fields, the Black Belt of Alabama, the Rust Belt of Wisconsin, and in the inner city of West Baltimore to build community-led, culture-driven power and wealth. Love that. Thank you, Ben, so much, man. I'm going to go over now to introduce uh, Ms. Tracy Hall. Ms. Tracy Hall, thank you so much for being here with us. Ms. Hall is in my hometown, Chicago. That's a great place to be, Ms. Hall. Uh, Ms. Hall was appointed to the American Library Association's 10th Executive Directorship in its 143-year history. You all have all this stuff. I'm just going to hit a couple of notes here. In her new role, Hall oversees the oldest and largest library association in the world, not in the country, in the world. That's a big deal. All right, um, Hall is the first African-American executive director in LA's ALA's history. Thank you, Ms. Hall, for joining us. Ms. Hall, I was looking and you said, could you be loved? Just quickly, why that song for this moment? I think this moment is all about um, empathy, all about the ability um, to love beyond yourself, to love um, as part of a larger continuum. And I think the real test is about not only being able to be loved, but to be love. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can talk about that a lot more. Just happy Thanks. to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm going to go to Mr. Carlton Turner now. Mr. Turner, thank you for joining us, sir. Uh, thank you. All right, all right. I didn't see your song come up. Did you plug one in already? Uh, not yet. I thought, we, I thought we was waiting on your prompt, but I can plug it in. Uh, my song you can, is- You can tell us too as you plug it in. What is it? Sure. Uh, my song is, uh, originally I was thinking uh, Sounds of Blackness Optimistic. Oh! oh. Wait a minute, I, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's the song. It's it is it is amazing song. But, you know, I actually wanted to you, when you brought up the Jackson Five, it made me think of another song, mm. um, which is uh, is also t hopefully turning people on to music. If you don't already know this group, there was another group in the '70s called the Silvers. Um, no, you didn't. They were, no, you they were didn't. Much like uh, Jackson Five, but they were like like eleven part harmony, all sisters and brothers, um, and they had this song called "We Can Make It If We Try." And it's, it's the most infectious song and, and funkiest track. And so that's the one I want to share with people. Um, please look it up on Spotify if you don't already have it. Trust me, you'll be singing it all week. Carlton Turner, you're going to make me cry, man. I, do you remember the rain? Yes. Yes, sir. All right, man. All right, let's stop. Me and you got to talk after this. You bring up the silvers, me and you got to talk. All right, let's all right. move on. Mr. Turner works across the country as a performing artist arts advocate, policy shaper, lecturer, consultant, and facilitator. And as you can see, he is a, a pretty good connoisseur of music, 70s music. Uh, Carlton is the founder of the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production, SIP Culture. SIP Culture uses arts and agriculture to support rural community, culture, and economic development in his hometown of, pronounce that for me. Uh, Utica. Utica, Mississippi. I'm sure some people say to you Utica, don't they? Utica, all kind of stuff. But yes, Utica. <laughs> all right. Thank you, sir. All right. So we're going to get down to, uh, to this panel discussion thing. I'm looking forward to this. As I said, when, when uh, I got started, we were coming up with songs. And I said, may you live in interesting times. We are looking out into a, a rapidly changing a rapidly changing, not sure where it's going kind of world. And at the same time, we got a bunch of leaders on this call. And those leaders are going to have to be giving a lot of thought to not just who says where we should go, but what they see in their own eyes. And we've got three people here today that are going to help us with that. Um, let's get the panel the, the discussion going. I'm early, but if that's okay with you all, let's get into it. Maybe give us a little bit more time to do some some other uh, small group discussion. Tell us about where you work. I'm talking to my panelists now. And I'm going to start going back. I'm going to go the order I started with Mr. Fink, so I'm coming to you, all right? Tell us about where you work 
in the community you serve, please? Sure. Well, where I work, um, well, let's just say this. Um, worked for years in the coal fields of East Kentucky. And um, obviously you hear my voice um, and you're pretty sure I did not grow up in the coal fields of Kentucky, um, which is true. Um, grew up um, raised by New Yorkers outside of Hartford, Connecticut. Um, got to the coal fields of Kentucky through connections through some work that I, some projects we worked on together. And um, my shtick, um, as those of you with some passing uh, familiar with Yiddish, uh, so my, 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 my routine, my way of performing. When I meet somebody in the coal fields of Kentucky, I'm pretty sure is on the right wing end of things. I tend to introduce myself as a communist Jew from the Northeast. And then they laugh and then we laugh together and it's like, all right, we can actually, we, we, we can be straight um, with each other. So I was, I worked down there for several years um, through a uh, company called Roadside Theater, a uh, grassroots self-described populist theater company. You probably have cause to say more about populism a little later in the call. Um, and what's really important about the work that we do is we don't serve a community. We don't engage a community. We don't do outreach to a community. We are no more and no less than part of a community. So I tell people, I don't do community engagement. And they say, well, then how do you describe your work then? And I say, I work with my neighbors. When I get people together to sing, to learn, to organize, to build together, I never go up to somebody and say, I want to engage you. It's like, hey, I want to get to know you. I want you to get to know me. Let's figure out what we can build together. Um, and for a self-described communist Jew from the Northeast working in the coal fields, that's the only way to work, honestly. Because if I said, oh, I'm, I've got a PhD and I grew up in Connecticut and I'm here to serve you, they will fully tell me to go fuck myself and they will be in their good rights to do so. And so I don't know, Ulysses, how much detail you want, but that's kind of an overview. You know what, man? We're going to be coming back around to you and getting as much detail as possible. From the time that you jumped into the green room before we got started, I knew I was dealing with a person that was absolutely going to speak his mind. And I'm hoping that everybody here is okay with speaking their mind. And I'm also hoping that everybody will check in if they are challenged by any language, if they're challenged by anything, please check in. I have to believe that everybody here is here with good intention. Mm -hmm. They've come here to serve. There's nobody here that has any intent of offending anybody. I want to, as they say, keep it as real as we can stand it. Mm -hmm. Right. We and I just want to honor that and say part man. of my work is always push that envelope just a little bit. But I hear you, man. Do I not want to cause any any hurt or offense, and sometimes I do, and always open to that conversation. And you know what, Ben? I get the re I get the feeling that the reason why you were invited here is because you would push that envelope. I'm going to go over here now to Miss Hall. Miss Hall, are you ready for me? You know the screen. Oh, there you are. These screens are funny. I have to find people. This is like Hollywood Squares times I don't know what. But there you are, Miss Hall. Mr. Mr. Fink, I'm going to ask you and Mr. Turner to keep yourself open because I may come right back to you. So be prepared. I'm jumping around to my panelists right now. Miss Hall, talk to us about where you work. And let me ask you this. South side, north side Chicago, what part of Chicago are you in? I am in the Pullman neighborhood of Chicago. So if you know anything about the Pullman Porters, uh, this is the neighborhood that George Pullman, um, who was a manufacturer of sleeper cars, um, it was the neighborhood that he actually built. He bought the land um, from the city of Chicago. It was on the far south side. So we are as close to Indiana as we are to downtown LA. And um, it is, um, a neighborhood that is also um, dark maroon on the heat map, um, COVID-19 heat map. Um, it is a neighborhood that um, is, um, that Ms. only has a grocery store. You got a little happiness going on there. You were fine and then it started breaking up a little. I want to make sure we get everything you got. Let's try it again. Okay, can you hear me? There you How go. How about now? No. Okay. Okay, and and it is a neighborhood also that um, where the only grocery store for a few miles around is um, actually in the Walmart, so which was recently built. So just giving you an idea of the context of the neighborhood, um, 
and it is a neighborhood that Eugene V. Debs and A. Philip Randolph um, did a lot of organizing in and have um, a legacy that is, I think, that looms as large as George Pullman himself. So um, it is a neighborhood of contradiction. Um, it is a neighborhood that is um, really labor driven. Um, and I think it is a neighborhood as a librarian and an artist, activist, someone who's also worked in uh, philanthropy. It is a neighborhood that really keeps me honest because the reality is um, that um, there are some everyday there's some everyday struggles that you cannot live in this neighborhood. And I'm, I come from Watts, I grew up in Watson, Southern California. It is a neighborhood that reminds me um, a lot of home because there's a lot of genius in this neighborhood that is often willfully overlooked. Um, and I will say, because the neighborhood has a, a, attracts preservationists as well, it is a neighborhood um, as well where uh, some dichotomies between um, wealth and intent, and like the quilt, um, you know, in the story, uh, and I'll end here, Alice Walker's everyday use, there is sometimes a conflict between people who fetishize, um, you know, history and houses like ours, all built in 1855, row houses looking a lot like Baltimore, and, and there are those who kind of fetishize it and preservation of it, um, of those homes, and there are others who live here because it is a lot less expensive the living in other parts of the city. And so the conflict sometimes and the coming together um, of different economic groups is another very, very um, real thing. So as a librarian and somebody who is really concerned with information and access and with equity, um, again, it it is, I love living here because I love history, but it is a place that keeps me honest. Thank you, Ms. Hall. You're still doing a little bit of choppy, some something choppy going on in there. If you can make any adjustment, that would be great. I think you came through loud and clear. I have to tell you, you don't sound like too many librarians of my youth, which is great. You know, you, you're an active librarian. The librarians that I remember are the ones that would look down their glasses and go, shh, you that don't see, sound like you. Ulysses, what if I told you that Audre Lorde was a librarian? She received her library degree in 1961 from Columbia. Uh, Dudley Randall was a librarian. Major Owens was a librarian. Um, and in fact, John Lewis was married to a librarian who encouraged him to actually run for representative. So I'm here to debunk um, the idea that you've met all of the librarians that are possible. We are possible. And I feel like we have been working in the background and I'm happy to be at the head of the American Library Association to say that um, there has always been a radical element, a progressive element um, in librarianship. And that is one of the only reasons why it remains one of the freest institutions that we have in this country. Well said, thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Turner, you ready to step in here? I see a lot of hands going up. Feel free, everybody. Uh, Mr. Turner, one of the things that I just heard both from Ms., uh, Mr. Fink and, and Ms. Hall as well, I, I'm hearing what sounds like redefinition, debunking. I'm hearing a lot of that. I want you to talk a little bit to that, but also let's get, uh, let's get uh, settled, settled in where you work in the community you serve. Sure. I want to start by saying yes to, uh, to, to bad librarians. Um, our board chair is a librarian, uh, and uh, she, she keeps everything moving in our community. Really excited for that. So yes, uh, absolutely. Um, I live in Utica, Mississippi. Uh, Utica, Mississippi is a very small community, about 1,000 people that live in the, the town proper, about 4,500 people that live in the zip code. Uh, we are small. We are Southern. We are rural. We are Black. Um, uh, we are made up of essential workers, people that are working uh, in, in, you know, the jobs that nobody wants or that have not been important enough to pay a living wage, but are important enough to keep our uh, country going in the midst of uh, the greatest pandemic that we've seen in our lifetime. Um, we uh, live in a community that uh, 40 years ago probably provided about 85% to 95% of its own food. Uh, meaning that it grew its own vegetables, it produced its own meats, whether that was pork or beef or chickens. Um, it, it had butcher shops, it had smokehouses, it had uh, cotton gins and, and lumber yards, it had multiple high schools and educational institutions 
Um, and now uh, the community has to either line up at the Dollar General to go grocery shopping or travel 20 miles to the nearest uh, grocery store. And, um, and what's interesting is that we haven't lost any of the land. So the land is still here. It's still fertile and available. Uh, we still have a lot of the, the, the uh, institutional knowledge and the generational knowledge about growing in agriculture. Um, we just have, have traded in uh, wholesale uh, this idea of, of, of independence and, and, and uh, self-sufficiency for the idea of convenience and an and upward progression that actually creates this space of relying on institutions that actually are only uh, are motivated by a profit margin. Uh, and so for us, the work that we're doing uh, is about a, a collective, comprehensive cultural community development. Uh, and so we're looking at the development of the whole community, not just aspects of it, the, the parts that can be um, economically feasible or the parts that can be, um, you know, connected to educational institutions, but uh, everyday people. Um, one of the things that's interesting about our community is that um, we, are, we are one of the places that the children of Booker T. Washington and, and, and George Washington Carver landed uh, and created the Utica Normal Institute uh, in, in 1903. Uh, which became uh, Utica, Utica Community College and is now the, the Hines, County, Hines Community College uh, Utica campus. But it's a place that was started around this idea of connecting Black people to, uh, to land as a source of liberation uh, and creating a product from the land and being able to produce your livelihood from the land. Uh, and so the work that we're doing is, is, is focusing on story uh, and, and food and these two places where uh, you know, the best stories I've ever heard have been around a good meal, you know, and so uh, thinking about storytelling and food as uh, just companions that are naturally put together, uh, we're working on focusing on, on using those things as leverage to build out new types of community foundations. So when we talk about, you, you bring up this idea of kind of like uh, bunk, debunking or reimagining or repositioning, um, we like to think about Mississippi People always talk about Mississippi as being um, the worst on all the, 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 the top on all the worst lists and the bottom on all the best lists um, and, and that we're stuck in a different time. And so I'd like to flip that for just a moment. Um, if Mississippi is stuck in a different generation, I hope that that generation puts us closer to a place in which these systems that have evolved or have transcended over the last few generations uh, are, are shown to fail. They're failing us in, in, in major ways. Uh, that Mississippi is actually closer to a place of recapturing some of the self-sufficiency uh, and self-sustainability practices that will allow us to, to understand freedom in a different way in the 21st century. So thinking about reclaiming food infrastructure, thinking about reclaiming educational systems, thinking about reclaiming healthcare systems, that Mississippi is actually in a position to be a leader in the country uh, in ways uh, that other communities, other big cities uh, are entrenched in different types of institutions that don't allow such a immediate uh, drawback and draw out of. I think Mississippi is positioned in a place where we can actually make some change and lead the country. Let the church say amen. All right, all right. I'm gonna come around here to you, Ben. Um, and again, I'm asking for Mr. Turner, Tracy, please stay open, keep your mics open, because I would like some exchange right here in this space between the three of you around this question, because this is the question of the day. Uh, adapting and transforming during this time. I heard a guy the other day saying, as much as people might know, we, we might have epidemiologists, we might have doctors, we might have, you know, people who know health, but health isn't the only part of this situation that, that we're, we're dealing with. It's not just about COVID-19. It's about all the other stuff that's being impacted too. And so when, it's, when it comes to dealing with adapting and transforming, there are so many other elements that seem to be getting pushed to the side that are critical to pay attention to. So to say something like transforming during this time, or I love it when people say a time like this, and I scratch my head and go, you, what do you mean a time like this? Show me another time like this. Talk to us about what do you do in these times to adapt and transform? 
Let's have some open dialogue between the three of you about that. Either one of you can start. So I just want to echo one thing that you said, Ulysses, which I think is so important is, you know, this idea that, oh, this is now this, you know, scary crisis moment and things were maybe hunky dory until about March and then holy crap, everything's gone to heck. Well, if you work in the coal fields of East Kentucky or, you know, South side of Chicago or rural Mississippi, all places where I've been, at least, and several of us you know, visited each other, um, right, this is not, this is not new. Um, and there is a crisis for a lot of people in this country and beyond that go far past that. And so when I get the question, you know, how do you um, adapt, you know, really the answer is we do what we've always done because we have always dealt with the crisis. In East Kentucky, that's what it looked like, the collapse of the coal industry that has put people out of work and you know the unemployment numbers we're seeing nationwide we've seen in east kentucky for a long time um same is true in west baltimore and the black belt of alabama um and a lot of parts of, of wisconsin where we're working so really what is the, the the question that i would rather answer is what are you doing now um that everybody else is noticing what the crisis is um, and everybody else is feeling a little more um, that there is an opportunity for solidarity now that there maybe wasn't before. And so one of the ways that our communities are kept in crisis is we're kept divided and conquered, right? We're kept divided along rural urban lines, along racial lines, along political lines. Um, and so people in the coal fields of Kentucky, so Letcher County, Kentucky is 98% white. Um, do not understand themselves or, or are made to not understand themselves to believe they've got anything in common with places like the south side of Chicago or rural Mississippi. Um, but the fact is, when we build together, when we create the conditions for people to recognize and to, and to get to know people in those communities, and not just get to know them, but to create something together, they recognize quickly, number one, that they have been divided in order to conquer everybody, that this is in nobody's interest except the people that will exploit everyone's labor and everyone's land. And number two, that together, we are not the minority of America, we are the majority, the vast majority. And when we act as that majority, we can be really powerful. Ben, thank you so much. I'm, I'm noticing here in the chat room, someone saying there's a danger. I think this is Aaron Joyce, there's a danger in thinking of this crisis as unprecedented. Perhaps the specific vehicle is new. And that speaks to the point that you're making there, Ben, is that there are people who are living in particular predicaments, difficult predicaments, all the time. Yep. And so to show up to them and say, oh no, they're like, what are you talking about? I see you shaking your head there, Ms. Hall. Yes, um, absolutely. I think, um, first of all, yes, uh, to Aaron, I think the um, one of the things that I was saying um, is that um, I was joking with a friend. I said, you know, there are some people who are terribly uh, upset that uh, the pandemic and also too, I think um, a continued um, reckoning around race in this country. There are some people who are upset that these conversations don't center them, don't make them the 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 continuous and persistent of attention. And there were all these people, um, you know, after George, George Floyd, who were trying to like solve racism. Like it just appeared on the scene right after COVID-19, right? And they wanted to do it quick. I was like very amused by all of the newly woke people Awakening is a lifelong process, so I'm, I'm not, you know, making light of it. And I would prefer that people are jarred into um, are, are, are jarred into um, an awakening rather than remain sleep their entire lives. Um, but because there's a danger in remaining sleep to other people's sufferings, um, and also to remain sleep to your own, right? Um, or through your own. So. But I think that, um, you know, something that I'm thinking about building on what Ben is um, speaking of is that 
Um, one of the things that I think we're fighting that's called me back to librarianship because I've been basically within arts administration and librarianship and social services, first working with the homeless um, my entire life. And one of the things that has brought me back, at least to this chair right now, is um, well before what ha has happened later this year is um, sort of um, the unfinished business of information access, the fact that there are so many people who are locked outside of any kind of platform um, reading as well as like digital literacy and access and also um, the, the degree to which I recognize even before the pandemic that it was a public health and a community health risk. Um, and so I think the thing that I'm kind of thinking a little bit about or to your point Ulysses um, and I think to the point that Ben is making is that this is not the time to sort of shut down. I think this is actually the time to innovate. Actually, this is a time to innovate without apology. Um, somebody was asking me, well, what do you think about these houses or what do you think about these buildings and who should we contact? I was like, um, saw the, law, uh, the locks off and go in and do what you need to do. You know, I come from Watts. People were living in homes. You know, I was born right after the Watts riots, right? So right. people... Um, we're living in houses. Nobody asked anybody, you know, like, is your name on that deed? We didn't get down like that in Watts. People, I mean, I, I don't want to be, excuse me, I don't want to, you know. Oh, it's okay. I don't want to, you know, I don't yeah, want to yeah. be talking about, um, well, I believe in the laws made by the people. And um, so I guess what I'm trying to say here is um, what I'm looking at is um, th uh, things like um, WPA. I'm starting to think a lot more about the um, Civic Conservation Corps, um, where a lot of young people, a lot of artists, a lot of organizers were employed for that specific genius um, to actually not, as, as Ben says, not to organize community, but to be in community, right? To leverage the assets of community. And I wanna say something I think Carlton is saying that I'm kind of trying to say, but not as eloquently is I believe in, you know, a lot of us are talking about historically in organizations codification. I'm interested in looking at what is organic and, and letting that move as well. And I think those are the things that um, could be codified. But I also believe that we have to be about undoing and unlearning in this moment, because let me end with this. And this is not, I believe we are the measure of all things. So I, I don't fetishize race. I actually think that to, end the conversation, to start and end the conversation there allows no growth. Living in this body, however, and out picturing as I do, I have a compass, right? And one of the things that kind of leads me to is understanding the ways in which um, people within Black bodies and women, Black women in particular, um, that our treatment allows us to understand how low we can go as um, as a collective. But what I want to say here is, is, is this. I want us to use, I think, this moment to understand the limits of, um, of Western European ontology. I want us to understand that um, to follow it to its logical conclusion will lead us off of a cliff. Because I believe that anything that is based on competition, anything that is based on othering, anything that is based on conquering, anything that is based on a pecking order, anything that it will lead us to a certain type of social and, and, and actual real ontological death, spiritual death. So what I'm saying here is that the reason why I think Black Lives Matter and other movements, um, and Black and Indigenous movements are so important for the entire collective is that they offer us a way out of a sinking ship. I want to stop there and I want that to sink in, but because we are the measure of all things, right? So it is not a them and us and that is a false thing, but there are other survival strategies. There are other ways to being human. There are other types of geniuses that we have not interrogated and centered. And if we continue to center the one that um, is being centered in this country and, and in the larger world, it's a sinking ship. I, I don't think anybody <laughs> wants to do that. I think people want you to keep talking, but we're going to go over to Carton. But before we go to you, Mr. Turner, uh, Julie, I'm looking at you and I got to say amazing Amazing work putting this panel together, Julia. Can we give it up for Julia Terry over at PHC, please? 
right on. Julia, thank you so much for putting this panel together. Amazing. Mr. Turner, um, I, I'm, I, I need to take a moment to breathe because I was holding my breath the whole time uh, Tracy was talking. <sighs> Your turn, sir. You know, Tracy said, said it all. I mean, all I can do is just, you know, just touch on a few points that she's already mentioned. Um, for me, this idea of innovation, I wanted to pick up on this idea of innovation because I like to think about innovation as an act of remembrance. Um, yes, just sir. remembering that many of the challenges that we're facing have already been solved. Um, and, and part of what white supremacy does is it actually negates knowledge, indigenous knowledge, existing knowledge, existing wisdom. It, it eradicates history uh, in order to control narrative. And by controlling narrative, you control how people think about the public, about policies, how to even think about themselves. So even this idea of whiteness, uh, you have to give up something to even take on this identity of whiteness, uh, that it, it's not something that exists naturally in the world. You know, you come from a country, you come from communities, you come from tribes and, and ethnicities, uh, and, and, and part of the strategy uh, in the US has been to dismantle all those things and, and keep them under an umbrella of whiteness in order to retain power. You know, so once we understand that, that these constructs are, are contrived, they're things that, that have been uh, created, we can understand then how, how to unpack and, and dismantle them, how to unlearn those things as Tracy was saying. Uh, so I think of innovation as an act of remembrance. I think about the indigenous knowledge that has existed in my community, in my land, long before you know school books and and the education system was, was was founded and i think there's an opportunity for us to look you know not to look back to those things not in a sense of nostalgia but in a sense of understanding that a lot of these issues have already been addressed and if we adapt um if we adapt let's just take climate change for an example if we adapt some of the indigenous ways of living with the land that we are standing on with the land that we are part of um, then a lot of the issues around climate change don't exist. I think about my grandfather who um, was both a, an organic farmer um, and a conservationist. Uh, he was born in 1910 and he, he, he probably didn't even complete the sixth grade, um, but he knew how to have an entire food ecosystem uh, without wasting anything. Nothing went to waste. Everything went back into a cycle uh, that helped to replenish and keep people fed. Um, I remember, uh, you know, working with him on the farm when I was a little boy. I remember also going and, and working in the woods with him to, to get um, firewood for the community, for, for elders in the community that couldn't, you know, could no longer harvest their own. And I remember he would like, he would go off in the woods and he would never pick like the trees that was closest to the truck. He would always go through the woods and find a tree. And then we have to haul that wood out of, 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 the, of the forest. Uh, back to the road, to the truck. And I always used to wonder why was he doing that? But what he was doing was he was picking the trees that needed to be thinned out. He was picking the trees that already had issues, had disease, had, you know, needed to be failed because they were no longer serving the purpose that they needed in the forest. Um, and he was creating a more healthy uh, ecosystem. I don't think that he learned that in school. I know he did. He learned that from his elders and they learned it from their elders. Uh, and so I think about so much of the knowledge that is just around us that we just are not able to tap into uh, because the, the, the bodies of knowledge that we respect and the ones that are validated um, are institutions that ultimately are, are leading us towards this place where Tracy was talking about this, uh, off this cliff. Uh, so thinking about uh, this moment and, and, and adapting and reimagining, uh, we have these opportunities. Um, we have children that for the first time in my lifetime, will be at home um, every day, you know, for the, for the foreseeable uh, fall and maybe into the spring, um, we have opportunities to disrupt the current educational system. We have, the, we have the opportunities to organize teachers and parents to work in a different configuration uh, that doesn't rely on the federal government uh, shaping the ideas for how education is developed. We have the op opportunity to actually redesign what it means for young people to learn and for families to learn together and for that learning to be connected to your life and to the place that you live so that you're actually changing the material conditions of your community, of your built environment uh, uh, in, in relationship to 
the things that you're learning, they become relevant in a way that they haven't been for our communities in a very long time. So I see these, all these opportunities, these opportunities to, to look back um, at what we've already figured out and utilize that to, to plot our way through this, uh, this turmoil. Mr. Turner, thank you so much. I know that Mr. Fink and I believe Ms. Hall, both of you have, you got some slides you're gonna share with us, is that correct? if and when it is helpful for the conversation. Okay, we're gonna see, I just want them to be ready. Taylor, we can be on the ready for that. One of the things that I'm, that I'm hearing uh, un underneath a lot of what's being talked about, uh, I keep hearing people talk about, Mr. Turner, the supply chain, broken supply chains, broken information chains. And Ben, when I hear people talk about this stuff, I'm thinking, I guess depending on the, the, the ends of the chain, where it begins and where it ends, to the extent that you don't have control of the beginning of the end, you're in trouble. You're absolutely in trouble. If you are not one who has the end or the beginning, if you don't have control, or as you're talking about the trees, Mr. Turner, being able to understand how these things revolve, if you don't understand it, you're in trouble. I think about the book, uh, uh, Medical Apartheid, Ms. Hall, that uh, Harriet Washington wrote. I mean, we're talking about uh, health situations that are just not new to certain people. So here's an opportunity, it seems, for us to reevaluate the, uh, maybe the, the delusion that we've been living in. Maybe we've been living in a space where we just kind of let go of responsibility. And maybe it's time for us to jump back into that responsibility and understand that, wait a minute, we gave up control of the supply chain and we decided we were just going to sit back. Mr. Fink, I'm gonna come back over to you, sir, because I think that this is right along with the question that, that we were dealing with. What are the implications for the future of community engagement? Now, I know you already said, you ain't into that. You, you ain't even into that. So what are, what, what, what are the, the things that people need to do internally, individually, mm -hmm. to reestablish who they are and the fact that they are not outside of the community? Yeah. You're either in community or you're probably nowhere. Speak to us about that. Yeah, I'll, I, I appreciate that. And by the way, you know, I say these things to just to provoke. Um, I'm not into language policing. Some of my closest colleagues use the term community engagement. We love each other and work with each other anyway. So this is not about, yes, you know, I, understand. I, I, I was in academia way too long um, to be into this word is good. This word is bad, but it's just a way to think. Right. I want to answer your question. I will do, pull up a few of my slides in a second. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think the work can be done just internally. Um, I think the work is done interpersonally as neighbors. So I said I don't do community engagement. I work with my neighbors. I think that is where the change comes from. Um, and sometimes I work with neighbors across the street. Sometimes I work with neighbors across the country. Um, but that's what we're doing um, one way or the other. We're working with our neighbors. Because when we are not working with our neighbors, and I'm gonna attempt a very smooth transition to some slides here, we'll see how awkward it is. When we are not working with our neighbors, um, then we act like Hillary Clinton acted in 2016. Um, when she said she came to coal country, to Southern West Virginia, not too far, um, from East Kentucky. And she said, we're going to put a lot of coal miners and coal companies out of business. And then later she said, I won the places that represent two thirds of America's GDP. So basically what she said to people living in coal country is, I know better than you. I've got the knowledge. I've got all of that, all of that kind of colonizing knowledge that Tracy was talking about. I've got it. I'm going to put it on to you. Um, so and the result of that, um, this is so a lot of nonprofits do the same thing, right? There's controversy about the Apple shop, uh, the Appalachian Media Workshop that Roadside Theater is a part of in this same way. Um, local guy said um, once um, there's a slur sometimes used of people working at an Apple shop called, they call them Apple heads. Um, and that's a lot of coal industry propaganda, but there's also something to it. So this guy actually on a hunting blog I found some years ago, Right, an apple head is somebody that sees the roof leaking so they can cry and moan and complain about getting wet, make a movie about getting wet, raise thousands of dollars from people in New York and San Francisco to buy buckets to catch the rainwater, but never once offers to climb up on the ladder and patch the damn roof. 
And so to do what we could call community engagement in an effective way to work with our neighbors, we've got to be ready to patch the damn roof. Now, I'll, I'm going to tell you I'm a communist Jew from the Northeast who thinks Donald Trump reminds me too much of Hitler while I'm patching the roof. I'm not going to lie about who I am and what I believe, but I'm going to work with you to patch the roof. Or in the case um, of a lot of the work that I do, of what we call community centers of power. And I want to say more, this is what I'm going to talk about now for just a couple minutes, because this question of how, how do you do this work in a different way? How do you start healing? Um, you need to work with a different kind of organization. I think what Carlton, when you said institutions are driving us off a cliff, um, I think that's super real. In a lot of work that's called community engagement, we work in places that look kind of like this. They're official offices. They've got a barrier between the server and the served. Ordinary people come in as clients, as consumers, as recipients and the people behind the desk are not part of the community, they are the servers. It actually dehumanizes both groups of people. Instead, we work with organizations that look more like this. This is actually a shot from the People's Paper Co-op held at the Village of Arts and Humanities where Mike O'Brien works, who facilitated the last session, um, who is a colleague and friend of mine. They do a lot of the same work that you might have to go to one of these institutions to do. In this particular case, it's about how to expunge an incarceration or a, a um, arrest or a conviction from your record, which as we know is a huge source of institutionalized racism and a thing that, that, that really puts a lot of people behind. They do that same work, but they do it in a space with a mural on the wall and citizens on both sides, citizens and neighbors who are working as legal, as, as lawyers and citizens and neighbors um, that are working, that are coming in with these, these expungement records. They do the thing, they help each other to do it. And at the end, they put those expungement, uh, they put those criminal records in a blender and literally make new paper out of it. So it is creative work, it is cultural work, and it is work at a storefront in a space where everyone is not a consumer or a service provider, but everyone is working together as neighbors. Some neighbors with law degrees, some neighbors with incarceration records, neighbors nonetheless. Same thing, right, so here's another, we, we, we like our sleek university spaces. We like our, you know, our, our, our sleek PowerPoint presentations. Nothing wrong with it, but a certain kind of work is gonna get done there and only a certain kind of work. We work in Letcher County in East Kentucky, more in a space like this. This is Campbell's Branch Community Center, um, deep, deep um, in a rural part of the county. They have dial-up internet there. They are still working to get broadband. We're still working with them to get broadband. Um, people come together to dance. People come together to sing. I've been on that stage many times. They've invited me up. And people come there together to get broadband internet. There have been meetings there where county government people work alongside citizens, say, how are we gonna solve this together? And then here's the real magic, what I was talking about before, about people being divided and conquered, right? North Philadelphia, mostly African-American, Letcher County, Kentucky, mostly Caucasian. Then when these two spaces come together, this down there at the bottom, um, we, are at, we are at Quinn Chapel AME Church in Uniontown, Alabama, in the Black Belt, a small town about 30 minutes uh, west of Selma. And this was the first meeting of the Performing Our Future Coalition. This is the organization that I organize. We got people from East Kentucky, West Baltimore, Milwaukee, the Southern Tier in New York, and the Black Belt of Alabama all working together in a space. And you see that um, on the wall behind them. That is generations of pictures of baptisms and weddings and funerals. This is a center of community life. So these are the spaces where we come together to work. And I'm gonna stop in a second, but I just wanna offer, and I've got this in a document if people wanna look at it, but a lot of people ask, okay, you know, this is really inspiring talking about working in community centers of power in spaces like the AME church, in spaces like the school turned community center, in spaces like the Village of Arts and Humanities, people, People's Paper Co-op, but how do you know? How do you know you're in one versus the other? Right. So we've come up with a little list of questions. We call it the ABCs, the Spotting a Community Center of Power. Accountability, belonging, and co-creation. 
is the accountability is the organization fundamentally accountable and again organization can be a building can be a group of neighbors sitting around a kitchen table doesn't matter the question is are you accountable to the people all the people of the community a lot of our organizations problem is oh no you're more accountable to the government oh you're more accountable to the funder oh you're more accountable to a national set of like nonprofit cool kids are you fundamentally accountable to the community as well as part of the community as well as representing the full diversity of that community belonging can anybody show up and feel like they belong it was the most beautiful thing when people white trump voters from east kentucky came to the arch social club oldest african-american social organization in west baltimore where carlton's work too they walk into that space and there is an embrace and that embrace is not about not recognizing our differences we all know what those are but we'd spent years building a relationship they walk into that space they feel like okay yeah this makes sense this is home we met together for three days and shared um volunteer fire chief um big time right winger um he comes into that space he sees the narcan right um inside the door we use to revive people who have opioid overdoses he says this is the same stuff we use every day in, King in kings creek kentucky can everybody go everywhere right you know there's a kitchen in the back of the art social club and our people felt like they could totally go in there help cook help make stuff happen if there's a big barrier between where you know, people where only the professionals can go and the plebs can't make it, probably not a community center of power. And then again, looking at those pictures on the wall of Quinn Chapel, do you see that this organization is a center of community life? Finally, co-creation. Does everybody participate? If there's a little elite that's setting the agenda and everybody else has just got to serve their agenda, that's not a community center of power. That's not where that transformation is going to happen. Can everybody participate? Can everybody who's willing to put the time and the work in step up and participate in leadership? And then to this question, only after all of those questions are answered, this question about COVID-19 and all the things that are changing right now, can that organization and does it adapt itself, not only to new situations, but to new participants, and also to recognize, as, as Tracy was saying before, that these are opportunities. Um, anyway. Lots more I can say about that. I'll leave it at that. Hey, Ben, thank you so much, man. I, I thinking as you're talking, man, I think about that, that notion that all politics are local. And I'm not just talking about yep. politics in a kind of- uh, No, it's all politics. It's you know what I'm saying? The community coming together to build together and to solve problems together. I'm totally with you. Politics it, is a small it, it, P. Ms. Hall, I know you've got some slides. I'm gonna go to, uh, Mr. Turner, you don't have any slides, right? So I'm going to come to you and I'm going to come back to you, Ms. Hall, and we'll get your slides set up. But I want to talk about this thing of the, the local importance of relationships, what, what Ben was talking about. What matters is where you are. Am I right? I mean, what matters is who is right there with you and who's making it happen where you are. It's difficult to take a global application to a local situation. It doesn't always work. And I want to hit on this point, too, because we're talking humanities right now. I'm constantly asking the question about humanities. How do humanities fit into this? Talk to us from your standpoint, Mr. Turner, about humanities and the importance of humanities in the local development process in times of these. Absolutely. So I think, um, yeah, uh, kudos to the ABCs. What ben, is what ben is presenting is absolutely the way that we think about our work. Um, for, 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 for starters, uh, we began uh, the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production with an idea. Um, but before that idea could become brick and mortar, before it could become, uh, and, and even moving towards the direction of a community center of power, um, we had to engage some of the oldest um, learning framework in our community, which is call and response. Um, I, I come from Southern Baptist, you know, uh, tradition, uh, and it's call and response was the way that you started every church gathering. It was, Mr. Turner, you know, I just so need to interrupt you here really quick. Talk to us about what that is. Give us an example of call and response for people who Absolutely. may not get that. Absolutely. So call and response uh, is a devotional practice 
in which someone uh, would speak a line or someone would make a, uh, make a refrain and the audience knew exactly what the response was for that particular uh, refrain that would come from the pulpit or from a deacon or from a mother uh, or from the choir. Uh, and it was this dialogue that would happen uh, that was the way that the community, the church worshiped together and the way that they engaged in ritual and practice and the way that they communicated uh, what stage of the ritual we were in. Uh, and so thinking about that as community engaged design process, we began our work uh, uh, with some designers, you know, as our, as our community partners. Uh, and we asked them to come in and work with us, uh, with our community, so that as we were engaging the community in this call and response process, that we were, we were prompting with questions, we were prompting with opportunities and with, and also with many, and many times we were prompting with um, misconceptions about what was happening in the community. And we were asking the community questions in ways uh, that we were engaging them in this dialogue. And we would uh, then uh, work with them to shape that dialogue with the designers into physical buildings and spaces and programs that we could then work uh, as a community to respond directly to what the community has said that it needed. So SIP culture evolved out of this community engaged design process, uh, a process in which the community was making the determination about what the community needed and then we would help to work to manifest that through our access to resources. So I want to just then take this conversation to the next phase, which is I think our work, because we have to recognize that we're, we didn't just become a global population. We've always been global. Our work has always been global. There's always been influences of, of Africa and the Middle East on South America and in Asia and, and all over the world that there's always been this connectivity and this kind of synchronicity in which things were happening in many different locations that were very similar. Um, and so picking up on that, our work at Civ Culture is both hyper-local, it's both right here in Utica, Mississippi, it's about the people that live here. It is also regional, recognizing that the way that the, the things that we're experiencing as an, as an organization, as a community, are duplicated all across the Southern uh, landscape. And so this regional connection in, in the ways that we can work and adapt and connect uh, and, and learn with. And then this exchange that needs to happen is, is on a national and a, and a global stage. So we're learning from people that are, that are facing similar situations about water and river systems in India. Uh, they, what they're learning there has direct implications on, on what we can do here in our own community. We're learning about issues of food sovereignty and how people are taking back their infrastructure from folks working in Africa. Like there's, you know, there's so much learning that can be happening and that's where the humanities come in. This opportunity for exchange, for engagement in knowledge building, in knowledge sharing, in, in, in breaking down the barriers so that we don't see what's happening on the other side of the world as a world away. I think that's part of what has gotten us into this mess now. Example is that when we, when we talked about, uh, when we made it okay to invade Iraq and Afghanistan and didn't see a problem with, with drone, uh, uh, drones taking out people indiscriminately across the Middle East, we also said that that was okay for you to do here in the United States because we've okayed that as a practice in a global community. And so we're not exempt from that. You know, so thinking about the way that we that we disconnect ourselves from people that we don't know, that we don't see uh, as seeing that they're not part of our community. We're all part of a global community. I'll end with this part, which I think is goes to, you know, what you, you set me up with here, um, relationships. In a rural community, and, and Ben can speak to this uh, just, just as well, relationships are the currency. It's how things get paid for. It's how... It's how things get changed, it's how the people understand themselves and their geospatial location and where they are. The history, the trajectory, all of that. Relationships are the currency. What's so challenging about this moment in COVID-19 is that the relationships in our community aren't built through Zoom, they aren't built through the internet, they aren't built through text messages, they're built through people interacting in physical space together. And when you extract that from relationship development, it becomes really different and difficult and different for communities to find their traction to continue to build and figure out ways to, to, to work together. And that's what we're engaging with and trying to figure out how do we use this as an opportunity to reimagine 
ways that we can build together uh, without the physical, um, with the physical limitations that we are currently experiencing through COVID. Uh, so those are some of the things I think are really important. And we consider, you know, Chicago is just extreme North Mississippi. You know, if, if you don't, if you in um, the South side of Chicago and you don't know nobody from Mississippi, you must not actually be from the South side of Chicago, you're from some other part of the, of the, of the Midwest maybe. But, you know, so uh, thinking about that migration and what those migration politics hold in terms of our relationship to land, our relationship to, to, to you know, so many people in Chicago that, that have active living ancestors in, in Mississippi, uh, but they don't necessarily understand what the connectivity is, what the relationship is, why they are in Chicago, why we're in Mississippi, why we continue to be kind of disconnected, but connected. So these are all places where the humanities can help us learn. Mr. Uh, Turner, at one point your, your uh, video stalled. I had no intent and I hope I did not break your flow it stalled on my end and I got ready to say something I thought you were done, so I apologize. I did not intend at all to break your flow. All right. That being said, um, every, every summer, as a boy growing up on the south side of Chicago, my friends would go down south. You, it was time to go down south when school let out. You know, so it was a ritual, uh, like a, re a, a retreat back down south. And so I, I totally hear you uh, uh, agree with you. And I think when Ben, you were talking about those pictures on the wall in that one spot, man, that stuff is crucial. I mean, it's part of the memory. We got to remember where we came from. And when we, when, we, when we see situations that are breaking those things up, it's difficult for us because you're chopping up memory. You're literally chopping up the learning. And so I want to come to you, Ms. Hall, in just a moment. You, we're going to get your slides set up. Taylor, we ready with her slides? Okay. Give me just a moment here because one of the things that I'm being asked is, and if you are, if, if, if I'll start with you, Ms. Hall, we want to know what inspires you in your work? What individuals inspire you? What organizations? And I'm going to ask this more specifically. You're, you're all readers of history. When you think about the fact that there is nothing really new about this moment, and that there are people that have had similar struggles. Talk to us about those people that you've read about in those times of struggle and how they've inspired you. Ms. Hall, please start. Oh, you know you're in a danger zone when you ask a librarian about um, reading. I, I, can, I can take it all the way back. I can take it all the way back. I would say that, um, you know, I'm gonna answer this question in a and we got up in these slides really quick. I would say that the thing um, that has really um, stayed with me is a book called Black Titan. It's about uh, a man whose last name is Gaston. And I, I'm wondering, I can't remember now if it was, I just had it in my mind, if it was Alfred or his name. The book is called Black Titan. There we go. Okay. Yeah, Black Titan. And he was. Um, he was a he was a poor black man and you know in the south and he decided that all of his wealth would come from helping his community and the first thing that he did is that he realized that uh, on the job um he was a coal miner that on the job people were being um gouged because if they if they didn't bring food um and sometimes there are a lot of reasons like no refrigeration uh, you know lack of access, some of whom, you know, if they didn't bring food, then they were being gouged if they bought food that was so standard. So he and his mom, he got his mom to help him start making food. Then he realized that um, there was no insurance um, that was available to them, and people were dying all the time because of the conditions. And he decided that rather than um, spare people the, the indignity of having to, like, have the families come down and pass a cup around that he would create insurance policies. And then he realized an issue that maybe might bring me into in a minute, um, a couple of my slides. And I wanted to ask, I wanted to, I'm gonna ask you in a minute. He, he decided that um, he wanted to, um, to work with people to overcome illiteracy and to help people break into jobs 
um, that would support things like his insurance company that was burgeoning. Right. So he created like this series of things. And it, it reminds me of, you know, what I'm saying. He didn't ask for permission. He had a coal miners education. He, he was a student of, of need. And he decided to respond to that and, and, and he grew with the community. So that's one thing that, um, that's a book that I, that I come back to all the time when I think, when I think about how we can build organic institutions that are not extractive. Um, so that's important to me. So I'm gonna come right back around you, but I wanna hear from you, Ben, and I wanna hear from Mr. Turner and then your slides are gonna come up. Go ahead, Ben. So Tracy, I really want to thank you for invoking the tradition of A. Philip Randolph um, and Eugene V. Debs. Um, I used to live uh, in the South Side too, admittedly Hyde Park, the well-policed, uh, you know, um, richer and whiter enclave of um, the South Side. But the tradition that people like Randolph and Debs were in um, is the same tradition um, that roadside theater works and that I locate myself in, which is the tradition of populism. And populism is a term that gets a lot of bad press these days and has gotten a lot of bad press for a long time. People call Donald Trump um, a populist, which is just absolutely an insult to the generations of farmers and workers and all sorts of Americans that have come together since the 1890s um, to say, we own what we make. That's the watchword of the Performing Our Future Coalition. Um, but again, it's nothing, it's, it's innovation by looking back. Um, it's remembering a tradition. Populism is a tradition of making together and owning what we make. And so it is deeply rooted in humanities because if we're, 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 if we're gonna make together in a deep way, we're gonna to make together rooted in our cultures, in our cultural traditions, um, and all the ways that they are specific and that they are shared. Um, and so I can go on for a long time about it, um, but I'll keep it, I'll, I'll keep it pretty brief, um, which is to say, you know, I've, I'm lucky enough to work with um, several civil rights veterans, um, and they told me the only political label Martin Luther King would take on is, populist. So what a populist is, we make together, we insist on owning what we make. Um, and those that are trying to plunder the commonwealth um, that want to take, the, 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 that want to own what we make, then we organize together um, against them. Um, and more specifically, we organize together to build and keep what we got. And so I, I'll, I'll share just a couple of things um, about that. Um, we work we work closely with a Jamaican economist named Flooney Hutchinson, um, who says, um, right, the, the way to do populist economic development, you strengthen the capacity of residents to exercise voice, agency, and ownership over their community affairs. And that's the way you create a community where they value. He has actually taken on, we own what we make. We've taken agency, voice, and ownership from him. Um, and he took, we own what we make from us. And this is now, um, the diagram that basically speaks to what populist work looks like, building community power, building our own power, telling our own story, um, and discovering and developing our own assets in ways that all strengthen each other. I'll send the link to this in a second. Um, but this is a tradition, uh, this is the tradition of populism that we work in, and it's deeply inspiring to the people we work with. And humanity's work is deeply connected to it. Um, art and culture fuel this work in at least three ways. In the process, the ways where people can, communities can come together to work across differences, learn to speak and act for themselves. The people, um, the people reimagine, tell a different story about themselves, including getting back some of what has been given up through learning to be white, as Carlton was talking about. And then we collectively create products. Populist work is not fundamentally about organizing against anybody. We're building and owning what we make, um, and we'll work with anybody that stands in opposition to organized exploitation. Um, I'll, 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 I'll leave it at that for now. Ulysses, you're muted. 
Thank you so much. Um, Carlton, we're asking the question about who inspires you, what individuals or organizations inspire the work that you do today. We're gonna come back around here to you as soon as he's done, Ms. Hall. Ms. Hall, I noticed that when you're, when you're a little bit closer to your monitor, you don't break up as much. When you step back and you start to really feel the spirit, I notice that's when you start to break up. So we wanna get everything you got. If you could lean in just a little bit when you're talking, it comes across a lot better. Carlton, so individuals, organizations that are like living inside of you that are coming out in your work, talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I'll start, um, I'll start with ancestors. Uh, definitely want to just acknowledge one, my grandparents, my grandfather and my grandmother that, um, you know, were, have been on this land and were raised and born on this land and taught me everything that I know about what it means to, to be, to live in the country and to, to have a good life. Um, even if you don't have any money in the bank account, you can still have a full and rich life. Uh, and, and, and so those, those values are at the core of, I think, the work that we're trying to do. I also want to uh, bring up uh, uh, ancestors Fannie Lou Hamer. Yep. Um, one, her work about, um, you know, she, she talked about this idea that if, 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 if you talked about this earlier about the supply line and supply chain, um, Fannie Lou talked about that if, if you had food on your shelf, if you had something in your cupboard or had some food in your freezer, it was harder for people to push you around because food was, it was the active currency. That was the thing. People were working to feed themselves. They weren't mm -hmm. working to, to build a mansion or to put a big nest egg back or to create as uh, this new, the, the new term, generational wealth. They were really about surviving. Uh, and so Fannie Lou Hamer created these, the pig farm, she created um, this movement around liberation, black liberation tied to agricultural production. Um, I think about Ella Baker, who, um, whose work was pioneered uh, from New York, um, like me, I was born in New York, my father's from Harlem, but I was raised here in Utica where my mother's from, but came to Atlanta uh, working for uh, the SCLC, came over um, and, and with SNCC, creating SNCC, and came over to, to Jackson, Mississippi and began to influence a whole, um, a whole bunch of people that have been part of my life. Um, people like Bob Moses, um, who also is a New Yorker, came down with Freedom Summer uh, and his work with the Algebra Project, which is about re redefining um, you know, education uh, as the political movement of this, of this century, um, specifically math, mathematics and math education. Uh, Hollis Watkins, um, who, is a, who just celebrated a birthday yesterday and is uh, just an amazing organizer and strategist here in Mississippi. Uh, Bernice Johnson Regan, one of the Freedom Singers who you know, I've been able to, to work with at the Highlander Center and learn from her. Brother John O'Neill, who just passed away a couple of years ago, who um, started the Free Southern Theater as a way to push voter uh, education and voter, um, uh, voter registration in Mississippi during the Freedom Summer. Um, then also think about people that are, that, are, uh, that are influencing me right now, people like Adrienne Marie Brown and Emergent Strategy. Uh, people like Lori Poirier and the First People's Foundation, the First People's uh, uh, Fund uh, out of South Dakota who's worked with tribal governments all across the country. Uh, folks like Ashley Henderson, who's one of the co-directors of, um, of the Highlander Center uh, for Research and Education. Uh, these are all people who, um, who I have direct connection with either through legacy, through learning from people that learn from them or learning from them directly, and people that I work with as peers that are continuing to um, educate me about how to do this work with integrity, how to do it uh, people-centered and people-leading, uh, and how to humble yourselves um, in creating spaces that are full of leadership. Uh, and that's, those are the folks that I wanted to call out today. Thank you. You know what, man, as I'm listening to you, I'm reminded, and I know everybody that you talked about are not ancestors, but it rem reminds me of the ritual of libation where you pour water and you are calling out the names of people that have gone and it's your way of saying, I say I, I am in agreement with those that have come before me and those who will come after me. Um, I certainly appreciate all of that, man. And I also remember my uncle Jesse, uh, who used to make me and my brother and I was a teenager. You know how teenagers love to wake up at five o'clock in the morning and go work in the garden? Love yeah, it. They love that stuff. Yes. No, they don't. <laughs> but back then, he used to wake us up first thing in the morning, 
Carlton, and we would be out in that garden, and he had one of them old water pumps, and I'm like, if some water don't come out of this thing real fast, and it didn't, it did not come out fast. But the integrity that you talked about, that, that integrity, you know, the holding it together, so important. So holding the memories together, so important. Remembering the names, so important. All right, Ms. Hall, we're coming your way now. And so, so that everybody knows, we got about five minutes before we jump into, we're gonna have some conversation, about 15 minutes of some talk back within the groups. That's coming up in a few minutes. I appreciate everything I'm seeing showing up. By the way, Ms. Hall, what is Chississippi? Is that how you pronounce it? That's Chicago, Mississippi, all in one? Yes. Right on, Chississippi. I ain't never heard that one. I'm probably not really from the south side of Chicago, huh? I'm a fake. Anyway, um, <laughs> are you ready there? Yeah. Let's do it. So I can, yeah, so can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, and I'm sorry, you know, uh, some days it's amazing and some days Zoom is, you know, it's like, but there's, um, there's also too a, um, a reality that um, when it comes to internet infrastructure, it is more plentiful in some neighborhoods and, and, and not in others. So I could really go into that, but, um, you know, anybody who lives like in a rural community or anybody who might live in um, the South, far South Side of Chicago, beyond uh, the University of Chicago Hyde Park, um, you know, and, and depending on where you are, um, you know, and just old infrastructure where people have invested, that's what we're seeing. So I'm sorry about that, but um, I think it is no a reality. Necessary, sister. I would have to say, and can I get a show of hands? You are coming across loud and clear every time you talk, even with the static can't stop you. Thank you. Thank you. So I want you to choose, since we have five minutes, I want you to choose your own adventure here. I can either, because libraries exist, they, there is an African proverb, I, think, I don't know what country or, or ethnic group it comes from, but it says that when an old person dies, a library burns to the ground. So there is an idea that the library is a physical structure. It is a collection of services. Um, but it also is um, the memory, the lived memory that sometimes is put in books, or that's why libraries have both books as well as programs, right? So, so I'm going to have you choose your own adventure. I can either um, do talk through some of these slides. I was going to talk about information poverty, or I could tell a story that I think um, speaks to the same thing. So would you rather see slides or, um, or the story? So just go through chat and I'll let you have like 30 seconds and we'll, 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 we'll see what it does. Let's get because I can, here. You're voting. This is interactive. Okay. Keep going. I can always send you the slide. I, the story. I love the stories you tell. All right. Okay. So let's see. Okay. So I, I'm going to go story, story and send slides. All right. Absolutely. So I'll definitely do that. I'll do that with Taylor and with um, Laurie and others. So, um, so I, I had an experience. I went to the University of Nairobi um, for a little over a year, my junior year of college. And I've always been, uh, you know, like big, big and strong. And if you're from the South, sometimes they would say fat and fine. Um, I've always had that going for me. So I went and, you know, I was meeting all my friends and my favorite friends. Um, one of them was named Sionzi. And Sionzi said, um, Tracy, you have to come home for the harvest. I told my family about you and you have to come home. And, you know, I'm thinking Kwanzaa because, you know, Kwanzaa is supposed to be the first fruits of the harvest. So I'm like, man, I'm going to celebrate Kwanzaa. I don't know if y'all know what Kwanzaa is, everybody. I know some of you do. But I'm going to celebrate this, you know, Black African-American um, holiday that came out of the 60s, but that was very inspired by um, Eastern African culture. So I'm like, yeah, oh yeah, I'm ready. I'm, I, and I, I packed all my fine clothes, such as they were, you know, it was just, you know, maybe a little bit better than some of the clothes I wore every day, and my shoes, and, and there we go. So we get on a matatu, like a little, you know, dollar dollar, like a little bus, um, then we get to a place that you can't do that anymore. We get on like a tuk-tuk, like a back of somebody's, you know, kind of a very old pickup truck. But then when we can't do that anymore, Sionzi's family meets us. And I'm thinking, we're here. It's, it's really small because, you know, Nairobi you go to all in this really bull. But I'm like, oh, okay, I can work with this. There's a few bookas, a few stores, you know. And, um, and then we start walking. And I'm thinking like the water, Ulysses, 
um, any this any moment now, this water is going to come. So any moment now, I'm thinking we're going to be at Seattle's home. We walked for miles. It was an eight mile walk when we finally got to Seattle's place. And when we got there, I am waiting for something, some light, some some stream or something to say a Panara, something to say welcome to Kwanzaa. Um, we went to bed that night, and I'm like, oh, the party must be, you know, tomorrow, because this is, you know, just, so I'm waiting. In fact, harvest was real harvest. Siozi had told her family how strong I was, and she had brought me home to do some work. And the family had laid the chores out, because the family needed me to do some of this harvest because a lot of her family who was still living on the farm were older. So I had to get those big jerry cans of water and, and I had to go and carry water for the first time. And you know how heavy, I'm not talking about the ones that they make the, the, the photographs of, you know, the little calabash. I'm talking about, you listen, chew my seed. That means like, you better be strong like iron. They looked at me, they gave me work. I cannot even tell you, I learned to work. Now my family is from Louisiana, so we, and you know, farm people. So Grand Cane, Louisiana, you know what grows there. But there was something, this is what I'm talking about, information poverty. Because information poverty is the notion that people, that poverty is intractable to the degree that people do not have expansive information networks. So even genius can be stymied. So there's social, you know, without um, having access to e either strong social or information networks, it actually increases the likeliness that, the likelihood that poor will stay poor. So, and, uh, so what happened is that there was some water up on this really high area and you had to walk up and walk down, walk up and walk down. I got so tired. Um, that I started sliding down. I would put my dress up on me and pull my skirt, you know, pull it up between my knees and my legs and just go down, right? Because I was, I hadn't worked like that ever in my life. But one thing that I had remembered is that my grandfather, when we were going out to Louisiana, he would work with um, holes to um, create a, a, a sort of makeshift irrigation system. And I had seen it. So I had seen some rubber and I knew how to sew. I'm just gonna basically what I'm trying to tell you is when I tried now, it was a it was only a moderate success, but it was a way to transport the water a little bit of the way. And it was only because I had seen it. And it was something that once people saw what I was trying to do, they could because they are, you know, real active genius and working that land, they could protect it. So in that time, one of the things that we did was to try to create a a transport system to just bring the water down a little bit closer. What it really was was about me bringing like my particular context and the fact that my family also took me to Louisiana, um, you know, summer times and things like that. There. So the thing that I want to say here is that um, it is about what Brian Stevenson calls is proximity. For all of us who are called to being together here, um, the challenge is going to be doing the work that Carlton and, and Ben is doing, is to be in community, to get up off the seat and to get out there. As a librarian, the thing that um, challenged me, I went from home services to librarianship, the thing that challenged me was to think about the fact that my my but that librarianship has to be inside the library. So the thing that I'm talking about here, I'm going to imagine, you imagine with me, what if every poor family, every family that is like really right under the poverty line, every one of those families. What if, okay, so can you hear me now? Yes. What if each of those families, what if every poor family had an information navigator? What if every one of those families has their own librarian, someone in the community, someone who's there to provide them uh, with access to a broader information network? What if that person was you? What if that person was um, a part of Carlton's institution or Ben's institution? That is uh, somebody whose job it is to take information um, particular areas where information is hit and distributed more widely. That's something that I'm really interested in. Um, it is something that I have, I'm going to start talking about it in chat in case um, I break up. But 
I tell you that story because I, the reason why I'm sitting here today is because a series of this information trickled down to me. Somebody told me about this program or told my mother about a particular after school program or told somebody else, you know, when times were hard, you know, what churches had food or in my community when masks and gloves and all those things were hard to find and hand sanitizers, um, you know, we took it upon ourselves to tell people who may not have access to the Internet because at any given time, 20 percent of households do not. They, they may not have the opportunity to pay for broadband or their phones may be cut off. So the thing is, is that each of you are a information navigator. I'm going to stop there and go check. But what I want to say is that the reason why in this poll is that we're as executive director of the American Library Association because I'm going to debunk the idea that the library is um, itself a physical bricks and mortar enterprise. It is being willing to share and not hoard in many of change lives. One more time, the ability to share and not hoard. Information that can change people's lives. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I say again, yeah, you were breaking up some, but I refuse to believe that we didn't get the meat of what you were saying. I think we got it. Everybody in agreement there? Cool. All right, so we're going to get over to our breakout rooms. Uh, we're going to go into these breakout rooms. We'll be there for maybe about 10 minutes, okay? And I want you to give some, say again, Julia? We'll have, tw we'll have 20 minutes. In oh, really? Uh, yeah. Oh, all right. An increase about, in time. Sorry, 15, 15. 15, all right. You going to take us there, Julia? Sure. Taylor, will you pull up the slide? Thank you. I, first, I just want to say thank you so much, Ulysses, Carlton, Tracy, and Ben, um, for giving us all just so much to think about and synthesize um, with everything we've done previously in this series. Um, and to everyone who's been so actively engaged in the chat, I feel like you were all, you know, right there with us in the panel. Um, so I love what Tracy said about this is the time to innovate without apology. And I would love if you could spend some time in your breakout groups thinking about, you know, what really struck you from this conversation or from this series. And what is a way that you, what is an action and maybe a courageous action if we're thinking about, you know, real innovation um, that you can commit to personally. And as Carlton highlighted, this is relational work. I think system change is also relational work. So what can you do relationally um, and within your organization to move from service delivery to working with our neighbors as Ben highlighted so well. Um, and finally, I want you to think about, and it's fine if you end up just talking about number one, because <laughs> it's likely that there's just so much that resonated that you'll discuss. Um, what do you need to, to take, take these actions? How can this cohort provide support going forward? Or what do you need from within your organization in terms of prioritizing time and resources to um, unlearn, dismantle, rebuild things that aren't serving the folks that you're accountable to? Um, so Taylor's going to work her magic and transport you all to into some small groups. And if for whatever reason you need to return to this main room, feel free. Um, and we'll be back at 11.50 to close out. Thank you again. I think everyone is rejoining. So welcome back. Um, I hope that you made a little progress in your conversation and that we didn't, um, I know that it was probably cut short. Um, but I want to make sure we have time to close with a few words um, from Lori. Um, first, I wanted to, I'm going to share this prompt in the chat. If you had ideas that you shared in your breakout groups around um, how, what kinds of support you need going forward internally from your organization, your community, or how this learning community might continue to support your work because um, reimagining equitable systems in and through the humanities and growing trust-based relationships with our commu the communities you serve is definitely slow and imperfect work. Um, and none of us are doing it alone. So 
so I think the and I think the panel did a really amazing job lifting up all the folks, ancestors and contemporaries who we can learn from and look to as we innovate um, new and old ways to move forward um, with with and for our communities. Um, so please share any thoughts you have related to that. Um, please, also, I encourage you to stay connected with us on social media as and if you are if you're willing to, we'd love to hear what commitments for next steps and actions you're able to take. Um, and it's another way of kind of collective accountability. So feel free to share a commitment or a takeaway with this hashtag, Engage Humanity PA, and make sure to tag us PA human, at PA Humanities. Um, mm -hmm. Taylor is going to drop a link to the survey, which will also get an email. Um, like like Don said, your feedback is really helping us to assess the effectiveness of this series and refine it and think about how um, how we can do this work going forward. So if you have time right after, I really encourage you while it's still fresh to just spend a few moments sharing your thoughts your thoughts um, or make sure you get to it later in later in the next week or so. Um, we'll follow up with a video and recap of the event and also some of this chat conversation as well as um, you'll have some swag and books coming in the mail and, as, and this lovely curated playlist that Ulysses helped us to create. So thank you again um, and I'm going to pass it to Sue if you're available um, or Lori want to close us out with any last remarks. Sue? I am barely connected, so I'm going to let you talk, Lori. I'm, while I am connected, let me just say thank you to everyone. Oh my gosh. And now I'm going to kick it over to Lori's ear before my microphone goes out because my video is not working. All right. Thank you so much, Sue. That was Sue Banks. And, uh, you know, thank you, Sue, and your staff. Um, this has been an incredible uh, partnership um, and experience. I saw um, in the chat someone said, thank you from my bone marrow. Um, thank you all um, from my very bones, too. Um, from, you know, Ulysses, thank you for that playlist. Uh, my song was I Hear a Symphony, and I heard a symphony today um, uh, through this experience. I have to say thank you to Julia Taylor. You have done an incredible, incredible job um, uh, leading this charge, and uh, Don Frisbee Byers, Taylor Tolton, uh, she's incredible um, setting this up. All of our panelists, um, uh, inspirational, um, spoke to us in our very bones. And thank you so much for the advisors um, that we've been working with. I saw so many of them um, here today. Um, thank you for all your contributions. And it's everyone who said, yes, we want to reimagine uh, community engagement um, um, and uh, to talk about how we can, as Ben said, be in community to define this uh, for ourselves. Thank you much. Um, just as you have given us uh, our, um, this gift of building relationships um, and creating meaning, which is at the center of the humanities, watch up for that gift back to you of those books. So Julia. Thanks everyone. I think we're all set. Um, I will say that the we're excited to partner with Uncle Bobby's um, bookshop in Philadelphia and support them through to place a book order that is curated by panelists from this whole series. So um, and I see even more great recommendations. So we'll try to make sure you get a longer reading list. Um, and thank you again to our great panelists and to Ulysses for, for moderating. <laughs>